Thanks for having me. Um, when I first met Heather, we were at American Chemistry Council was hosting a marine debris dialogue not too long ago um, in the spring, I think it was, in Rhode Island. And I got into a great conversation with Heather, with Heather about kind of our role. What's a converter? Um, what do we do? She asked the question, I think a lot of you are probably asking, why can't it just all be recyclable? Just, just do it. Why can't we just do it? So we're going to talk a little bit about why we can't just do it today um, and, you know, how to move forward from that, okay? So a little bit about Print Pack. We've been around about 60 years. Our, our founder, we're still held privately by the founding family. The founder passed on about 30 years ago, and the second generation still running the company, still very active in the company. Um, about $1.3 in sales, 3,200 associates, okay, 18 manufacturing plants. I've worked in, in four of them. I actually have an operations background, um, so I've, I've run three of the plants globally and uh, worked in four um, totally. So I've been around the, the business a little bit. Everybody hear me okay? I don't, I don't know about the closeness of the microphone here. Okay. There. Is that better? All right. So here's what we do. Um, I, I know probably if you're living on an island, you may not have a lot of our products in your pantry, but most of the United States has a lot of it touches or interacts with our packaging. And um, you can see there's a broad range of, of things from what, what we may lovingly refer to as dust covers, like toilet paper wrappers, you know, towel and tissue, still highly engineered films, but um, really their main function is to contain the product, right? And on the other spectrum from that, it would be a, a pouch like the little Mott's applesauce pouch or, or even some of the rigid containers, the, the dice fruit cups or the olive cups that are very, very high-performing packages. And we'll get into what makes something high-performing from our perspective, which may be different than yours. Okay? But you can see, consumer packaged goods, we're pretty well known for food in the industry, even though I'm pretty sure like four of you have heard of Print Pack until today. Um, and a lot of that's because we're, we're privately held. But we are probably in the grand scheme, th in, in the middle of the grocery store aisle, we're, we're num number one or two probably on each aisle when it comes to packaging companies. When you talk about the 15 billion pounds of polyethylene resin used in the U.S., we use like 200 million, right? So we're not that big. But we're, we're pretty big where we are, Okay. So I'm going to talk um, now about, and, and Nina, I think, gave like 90% of my presentation, which is great. I was glad to come after her. So I'm going to dig into a little bit more about, about what we're doing um, to further that. And th does everybody know what a converter is? I, I, I should have s started with that. So um, in, in the industry, right, you have the... As you go through the supply chain, you have the resin companies, the raw material suppliers. Those are the Dow's, the DuPonts, now Dow DuPont, right? Um, Chevron Phillips, a lot of big petrochemical companies, um, Brass Chem, those, those size. And then on, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the, the big retailers. And then because the retailers are big, the brands got big, right? So you have these big brands. Um, the converters are the ones that take the pellets and convert it into a usable package, right, that the brands then put their, their product into. We don't actually fill product, right? So we don't get into ingredients. Our ingredient is the package, and we're trying to keep that from becoming an ingredient, right, <laughs> ultimately. Um, so that's what we are. So as, as we look at um, kind of how plastics are viewed, uh, this study has been referenced, I think, three or four times um, today, and I, it's, it, it was great to see it uh, come out. The first one, there's actually two different studies. One's really around kind of the background of the issue, and then the second study really is about, okay, what did you do about it? Uh, and, and the slide that I pulled out of, that, of this particular slide is from the what are we going to do about it study, the catalyzing action study. Um, this is really the only slide, and this is coming from somebody, you know, in, in, as a plastic processor uh, in, the, in the industry. I, I disagreed is a strong word. I don't necessarily disagree with the slide, but I, I'd like to have it in here 
because this is the the discussion and tension, uh, you know, around the topic. Um, but this is really the only kind of thing I, I didn't totally agree with in the study. I mean, it's like 200 pages, these studies, totally. And, and I generally agreed with most of it. Um, this is pretty aspirational. Pretty aspirational, right? So, um, you know, to say that what are we going to do about all this plastics? Well, you know, 50% of it, we'll just uh, recycle it with radically improved economics and quality. Yes, <laughs> we should do that, right? 30% of it is fundamental redesign and innovation. Wow, yes, yeah. Yeah, we should do that too. Um, and 20% actually, we wouldn't reuse ours, so I don't disagree with that at all because <laughs> it doesn't really apply to the type of packaging we do. You can't really reuse ours. Um, you, can't, you can't put food back in it and then reprocess it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why you can't do that. So I think it's, it's good because it makes you, it, because you, I know you, there's some of you in the audience saying, why can't you fundamentally redesign and innovate? What's, I mean, that's what got you here, right? Everything was in glass. Everything was in paper. And, or everything was getting thrown out. And now it's not. Why can't you do that? Um, and the answer's coming. I'm not going to answer it on this slide. But I, I do think it's, it, this is what, um, this is what, uh, you know, universities are working on. This is what uh, uh, companies like us are working on. And, and you'll, you'll see at least who we're involved with. And, and we're just the tip of the iceberg, right, of who's working on this. So um, it's, it takes an industry, essentially, to, to do this sort of work, right? So here's um, something you also see. And, and I, I like it. In, in another sense, and I don't like, I'm, giving, I'm like giving you a presentation I don't like, right? Um, but these are, this, this particular graphic was one um, that we, we've used in the past and talked about, and it's still true, right? That there's three basic legs to a sustainable business. Um, there's the, I'll start with the economic one, because that's the one most people blame for why we are where we are, right? Because the economics of it. Um, but there are, it does need to be, you know, you, you, you got to have a viable business, right? You have to have somebody willing to pay what they're willing to pay for what you're selling. So pretty basic. Um, then you have to add something to society, and you have to, to consider the environment or have the environment um, be part of it. And it's felt like to me, and the reason, the reason I don't love this is it feels more like this. It feels more like a tug of war, and it actually feels more like this. I'll let you in your <laughs> you can determine what the little dog is, right? But it's it's probably not economics. That's a hint. <laughs> the little dog is in economics, okay? Um, so we are stuck there. And I mentioned, and I, I leave this in here because sometimes, and I'm not I'm not, you know, crying about our place in the world, but sometimes this is where the converters are. We're big we are a big converter. Um, there's a lot of converters that are just, you know, two machines and they have no pull when you start bringing in large brands, large retailers, large whatever. They have zero say in the decision. A lot of times they don't even make their own, um, they don't even extrude their own films. And we'll talk about what I mean by when I say that. But um, they're not vertically integrated. I'll just put it that way. So they really are the small dogs. And we're a medium-sized dog. And, you know, sometimes it feels like that. So what do we do about it? Um, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't like to end conversations on a, a down note. So we're going to talk now about where our place is. And this is actually when I came back. I came back from China a couple years ago, um, two years ago now. And when I left, I was there five years, right? So when I left seven years ago, the how to recycle label was in its infancy, um, it's probably the best way to say it. I was not fully aware of it at the time, truth be known. Um, and when I came back, and I'd, I lived in, in China, I came, came back and I read the Ellen MacArthur, the first study, and in it, the world finally understood that the U.S. is not the number one contributor to the garbage floating in the ocean. I'm not, I may be telling you that, and if that's the first time you've heard it, you shouldn't... It, it, that's not. I'm not making that up, right? Go look at Ellen MacArthur, and you'll see. And if you've been to 
a developing economy, you know that. You know when you walk around a developing economy, um, and particularly the ones that I've been to, it is heaped up on the sides of everything. I, uh, I, a lot of, a lot of it, uh, a lot of what colors kind of my my background um, or my views of things is. Uh, I've got three boys in scouting, and so we've been camping in a few different things. We go camping once a month, and in China we would camp in um, in a a Buddhist temple. You know, it was just one of the places we ended up going to, and they had a mountain inside the whole temple grounds. And we would do leave no trace, right? That's like a, uh, it, it's, you know, pushed by scouting. I'm not sure if they originated that term, but leave no trace, right? So we do leave no trace walks. And in an hour in the temple, we would collect like three grocery bags full of just pack consumer packaging. I mean, if you're going to do that to your holy lands, what are you doing walking down the street, right? So I, that's not... I, that, I don't want to, you know, get too much on my soapbox, but I'm just telling you that we have a different problem here to solve than what they have to solve in in their own. Um, so that's so I came back and I'm 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 reading this study and I I go to the some SPC um, um, working groups and I start saying, okay, this this is where my job gets pretty fun now. Right, because I've, I've, you know, as Nina said, you got passionate people, right, that go to SPC events, and that's true. Um, and you know, I have the pleasure in my role. You see, my role is actually business development. Um, it's not my role. Isn't I'm not a chemist. You know, I'm not a packaging development um, person. I'm a business developer, market development manager is my actual title, but I'm I do business development. So the cool thing I get to do is I get to go into the brands and talk to them about this. And this is basically, this is, this is uh, SPC's riff on a circular economy. So this isn't something PrintPak created. Um, this is the life cycle of a package. And it too is aspirational, right? If you look at the size of the recycling, the little blue uh, thing that connects the wheel there, um, it is larger, right, than it really is today. So this too is aspirational. But if you look, and I think it, I can't tell, it's probably not the easiest to read maybe from there. So the two legs coming in on, um, on the left-hand side there, the two green legs, the smaller one is just other sources, and the main one is basically saying that petrochemicals are kind of the main source of raw materials. So this is where your materials come in. Um, and it, as Nina, Nina talked about, uh, the different categories that they focus on. So this is this is kind of the how you would break that down into a life cycle approach, right? Um, and I'll and and as as we're looking at sourcing being the kind of the first step, this is where we first touch any of this. Um, you know, I'll sit down with a brand and I'll say, all right, so here's how we approach it. It's life cycle. What do you what do you, what's your five year goals? Now I've already read their five year goals if they've had it, um, but it's an opportunity for them. You know, so when we sit down, say, with even, even a target, uh, and we, we talk to them, we say, what are your goals? They put up their five goals, and you can already see, well, they're probably not going to be interested in this, this, or this, right? Um, and behind all of these, there's probably three or four other developmental things that I, I can't talk too much about, right? So, but on the sourcing side, this 68%, I think it's funny, it is actually 68% bio-preferred content. So, we did get the the... Uh, bio preferred um, deal that comes with that, and you know I th I'd make a note um, on this one in particular. I love this one because you know it is a serial liner, right? So when you think about are people willing to pay for it? Um, I think Dennis told us it was zero percent. Where's Dennis? Where'd he go? Is he here? It's three <laughs> percent. It's it's three. It's 67% say they're willing to pay more for more renewable or more uh, sustainable packaging. It's actually like three. But apparently that 3%, a lot of them buy cereal. So this is uh, with an organic brand of cereal. It, it does have to be an organic brand. Um, we, the the br major brand that um, owns the organic brand cannot afford to do it across all of their cereal lines, just the organic one. 
um, because their base customer is not willing to pay for this. All right, so as we come around, these this this next one is our goals. So uh, you know, obviously, uh, the title of mine uh, of this when I went into it was environmental responsibility. So we do have a responsibility. We take that seriously, obviously. And so these were our ten-year goals. We're in the last year of the ten years, um, and we've just I was just at at the plant managers. Uh, we have a plant managers meeting. We just talked about the next five. So. Uh, yes, we've got five-year goals coming on. Um, the next two are where, you know, you would traditionally see a company like PrintPak kind of making our case for plastics, in particular flexible plastic packaging. Um, and I, I didn't feel like I should go into the full benefits. If you want to, you can go to, like, uh, Flexible Packaging Association. Do, they do a very good job of talking about why, you know, uh, if you did what we could do with glass, it would weigh 60 times more or create 60 times more carbon emissions. I, I'll just say, with the exception, the notable, very notable exception of the end of life, plastics wins every, just about every single life cycle assessment. Just about. It may not win every. I'd be interested to see the ones it doesn't. But just about every time you take a life cycle assessment view of it from from the ground to the end of life plastics typically wins and it's typically because it's lighter and it and it's flexible and it can and it protects the product better in different ways in different applications so i that's the only pitch for flexible packaging I'm going to directly give you. Um, but FBA is good. Uh, they do have real numbers that have other groups have done that are worth looking at. Uh, the example here, if you look at this this uh, milk jug that was brought up, um, it takes 15 trucks off the road to go from a milk jug to the flexible packaging. So 15 to 1 from a converter of milk jugs versus us, uh, you know, uh, in the logistics chain can come out. Um, fun, fun factoid, I like to use fun factoids for the next one for uh, reducing food waste. The longest, le the, the, the longest shelf life that's out there is a flexible packaging um, that I know of, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But it is, um, it, it's actually 10 years, and uh, it's, the, um, it's the military um, meals ready to eat, right? Now... Things of, to note about the MRE, right? And I think when you think about packaging, you should consider these. If you're not homesteading, and by homesteading, I mean, I don't mean that as a joke. I mean, like, you're making your own food, all of it, right? If you're not doing that, which most of us probably aren't, um, but I can tell you most of America's not, right? <laughs> then, then what are your choices, right? What are your choices for food? You can, you can homestead. We talked about that, right? You can homestead. You can put a bunch of junk in your food. You can genetically modify your food, right, so it lasts longer by itself, or you can protect it. But that's it, you know. Those are your choices. So our, you, when you look at, um, at reducing food waste, it's kind of hard to separate, you know, packaging from that because protecting it really is, I don't, I don't want, I want my food to be food. I don't want it modified unless the pilgrims were doing it. Like, the way they did it, that's fine. I'm fine with that, right? Fine with, like, uh, bees doing the modification for me, but I'm not fine with the test tubes, all right? So, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. So, I'm fine with that, um, but, but if, if we can't do that, if our food is more fragile, then we're expecting more of our package. Um, the last one, the recovery there, uh, and the offshoots are around composting and landfill. Um, We've we've bet we've bet bigger on not just and and Nina talked about it so I'm going to burn through the next few slides around it but um, there's recyclable and actually recycled right and I I was just in a conversation this last month where I had a brand owner ask me what percentage of the package is recyclable so like like fifty percent recyclable I don't know what you mean. I mean, these are real questions that people ask, um, and it was in a startup. I'll just <laughs> so, great work from How to Recycle. Our role, 
As Nina said, the conversations changed. Brands are asking their suppliers for, for, for more information about their package. Our role is when the brands ask, we're, we actually formally joined How to Recycle as a, as a member so that we can have all the testing done. So when a brand comes to us and says, hey, this uh, bread bag, it's, oh, yeah, here's the test. You know, and, and SBC's already got all the information because we went ahead and did it with Trex before that, right? Now, this is all polyethylene, right, the store drop. We have, uh, we've, we've got a bunch of different, Places where we've got things that are pre-qualified that are polyethylene, you can see there what they are. Um, the PE pouch is one. We're actually launching a new format today. It's where I'm really supposed to be. It's, I'm supposed to be at Pack Expo. So, um, but we're launching a high uh, an HPP processed um, uh, pouch that'll be a spouted pouch. It's all polyethylene. Uh, we've got several versions of it um, that are also barrier as well. So, what about all the other stuff? the non-polyethylene stuff. All right, and this is getting in a li little bit about why we are where we are. So this is a typical snack bag right here. Um, and the coax, I know it gets small, right? The LLDP, the coax film, that's probably, you know, depending on what it is, it's probably three layers and five or so materials. Um, so we got overprint varnishes, right? Makes it look beautiful. Com composters hate it, which you wouldn't throw this in there anyway. So, um, so we got an OPV that makes it look good. Uh, it may make it matte, right? So matte's a big deal now. If you walk, uh, if you walk in the aisle, a lot of stuff's matte. Um, PET is a very common film. Prints well. If you notice, then the ink shows up. The ink is layers in. Well, why is that? So you don't scuff it off, right? Um, and then adhesive, we glue it to an OPP that could be metalized. So that's why the in, inside of your chip bags sometimes look like aluminum. It is aluminum. It's vacuum deposited on an OPP typically. Um, and then another adhesive and then the polyethylene. The polyethylene serves as a sealant layer so they can glue the, create a hum hermetically, hermetic uh, seal. And sometimes we'll put EVOH in there as well, which is another barrier. So the point is, it's complex, right? This is a multi-material. I've heard it called a multi-laminate. I've heard it called a laminate. Laminate just means to glue. So this, if you saw the, like the wood earlier, the composite wood, that's laminated, right? It's laminate wood. You've heard of laminate floors. Laminate just means the glue. Um, so what, do you, what are you laminating is important. Actually, the PE pouch is laminated, and it passes all the tests. So laminating by itself, you gotta, you got to ask what, right? I am. I'm wrapping it up. Okay. There's two slides. Check it out. This is interesting. You'll see this is why everything is different. Uh, there's there's uh, a whole range of performance. That's the number one reason why it can't all work, okay? The performance is totally different of all of these materials. A lot of it is the difference in how you can make it versus what it does for barrier. So on the right side is all the barrier stuff. So this will be in your recall. Material. I'll leave the last slide. I'll just stop here because this is probably one I think um, is of interest, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see if uh, maybe somebody can ask me about pellets, and I'll talk to you about pellets if you want or nurdles or whatever they're called.